This is QTV News. I am Maria Tusidibe and thanks for joining us. Now, the main local, international and sports news headlines. The Education Ministry gets ready to reopen schools and says all the necessary precautions will be in place. A stakeholders virtual roundtable meeting discusses COVID-19 service delivery decisions and level of accountability to citizens for various countries. We'll hear how the community of Jangjangbure has decided to act to address the lack of street lighting in their area. The girl guides get a brand new well at their headquarters. In international news. On World Suicide Prevention Day, we hear a proposal for a Gambian national strategy on suicide prevention. And the lawyer who defended Nelson Mandela and many others against charges filed by South Africa's apartheid regime has died at the age of 92. In sports news, South African track star Casta Semenya loses her latest court appeal over allowable testosterone levels for female athletes. Those were the main headlines and now the news in detail. In local news, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, MOPSI, is preparing to reopen all schools across the country. As Omar Pijalo reports, MOPSI officials say all the necessary measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 at schools will be put in place. The Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, MOPSI, organized a meeting with stakeholders to discuss strategies to reopen schools and the safety measures for both teachers and students to counter the coronavirus. The Deputy Permanent Secretary at MOPSI, Adam Ajimba Job, appealed to stakeholders and philanthropists to support his ministry to enable the quickest and safest reopening of schools. According to Lamin A.K. Sanyang, chairman of the executive committee of the Conference of Principals, his committee submitted the following suggestions and recommendations to MOPSI for consideration and approval. That the last two weeks of September be reserved for admission, planning and preparation of school grounds for the new academic year, as new innovations have to be considered for the new session in the context of the pandemic. That the proposed date for the start and end of the 2020-2021 academic year be from 12 October 2020 to 31st August 2021. It was also recommended that the school calendar should also factor the following length of school day to be from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. School week, Mondays to Saturdays, two days in a week per stream or cohort, double shifting be allowed for schools that can manage with their enrollment. Teacher deployment and management be well calculated to avoid acute shortage. So that school holidays of Christmas, Easter and so on. Schools are expected to strictly comply with all protocols to prevent students and teachers from getting the disease. The Director of Basic and Secondary Education Programs, Mrs. Tida Jarajaju, said all the schools are to be fumigated and provided with hygiene and sanitation materials, thermometer guns and face masks.
the Deputy Secretary General of the Gambia Teachers Union, Esa So, spoke on teacher welfare. The ministry is urging the public to ignore information circulating on social media and wait instead for the official announcement of the exact date for the reopening of schools, which will be communicated to all media houses in the country. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar Pijalo. A stakeholders virtual roundtable was convened by the International Republican Institute on Thursday to discuss COVID-19 service delivery decisions and level of accountability to citizens. The meeting focused on education, agriculture and trade. Alucise reports. The virtual meeting was convened by the International Republican Institute, IRI, to facilitate dialogue between representatives of the ministry's concern and stakeholders regarding the major decision taken in relation to COVID-19 to ensure accountability during and post the pandemic. Robina Namusisi, IRI's country director, informs the meeting that IRI, a non-partisan and non-governmental institute, opened an office in the Gambia in 2017 and has been working with the National Assembly, civil society organizations and government ministries and agencies to support the coalition government's agenda. We want to hear from the, from the executive how decisions around COVID in as far as education, trade, agriculture, and health were done. What were, you know, what kind of uh, communication or what are the strategies these, uh, you know, the ministries used uh, to inform citizens about the, those decisions that are taken? Lamin Sise, a representative of the Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science, and Technology, says the advent of the pandemic and subsequent report of the first case in March disrupted and affected lessons at the tertiary institutions after the declaration of a state of public health emergency. He told the meeting that the ministry engaged stakeholders such as the UTG and other colleges to ensure learning continued, resulting in the introduction of the e-learning program. CISA confirms that no study had been commissioned so far to establish the program's success and challenges. However, he opined that it was a success but had challenges in terms of internet connectivity despite data allocation to students. He announces plans for tertiary institutions to resume normal lessons soon. For Adam Ajimba Job, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, the distance learning using TV, radio and online platforms proved workable, but the lack of access to TV and radio for students, mostly in rural areas, undermined the initiative. According to him, the distance learning is an existing policy that was accelerated by the advent of the pandemic. He blames part of the failure on parents not getting children for the lessons. But we have not covered 100%. That it wasn't a perfect system. It was something that we were using for the first time, trying to learn from it, and definitely there were challenges, but we will say it was a success. According to him, efforts are underway to reopen schools in a safe environment for students, but could not confirm the opening date. He announces plans by his ministry with the support of a development partner to have internet using satellite in all schools across the country by the end of October. By Mas Mbai of the Ministry of Trade, she has the challenges and way forward in relation to his ministry's response to the COVID-19. So smuggling of essential commodities as well, this was a major problem. This was a major problem uh, when we were trying to enforce the, these regulations. So some of the way forwards, um, we proposed to, even though the regulation on essential commodities is lifted, would I to continue to monitor prices and stock levels globally and in the domestic front to be able to respond proactively to any shock in the economy. Sarian Jobate of the Minister of Agriculture says COVID-19, despite not affecting the natural resources on which production depends, poses a threat to food security. Also joining the meeting was Bright So of the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, who says the COVID-19 situation in Ghana and efforts to contain it amid several misconceptions. Uh, those in the expenditure tracking cluster are basically tracking the use of COVID-19 funds by government uh, to ensure that the funds are used in the assigned areas and that there is compliance with procurement laws and emergency procurement guidelines. It is hoped that this meeting will open up a room for more transparency and accountability with the proactive disclosure of information. 
The virtual meeting, moderated by Momo Dumboj, host of QTV's flagship current affairs program, The Viewpoint, was also attended by invited representatives of the civil society organizations, local government areas, national assembly members, and media. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. The people of Janjambure in CRR have begun the process of installing 200 solar street lights as part of a self-help initiative to light up their streets. Loli M. Kamara visited the town and now reports. Janjambure Development Network comprises more than 300 members of its residents, non-residents and those in the diaspora. Speaking to QTV, the ward councillor Ibrahim Afun highlights the importance of the street lights. Adding that the initiative shows that residents of Jenjambure are ready, committed, and patriotic. We sat down again together, discuss about this solar light project because um, we are all citizens of this community here, and we all know that Jenjambure don't know darkness. So we used to have light here from the colonial days down to date. So, but actually, um, from the previous government. There was a project called Rural Electrification Project. Um, that Rural Electrification Project is a project that didn't help Janjambure at all because that was the project that took away our own power station. So that was the same project again where we lose all our street lights. And now the sons and daughters of Janjambure are saying that we are coming together as citizens of this beautiful community to make sure that we give the community what it needs. And it's the agenda, idea behind, so, and it's what we are working on. Mr. Foon for the pledges for more support for the success of the project. And even people who are no citizens, because Janjambure is a place where many pass through. Amitage is one big reason. There are many people, good people, who pass through Amitage here. And Amitage actually is in Janjambure. So we are appealing to everybody to come on board and make sure we make this happen um, uh, for the betterment of the people. Because it's risky going out in the night when everywhere is very dark like that. The governor of the region, Abba Sanyang, described the project as significant, adding that government cannot do it alone. It has helped the whole region at large, particularly Sierra South and the whole nation at large, because it is the responsibility of government and its people for the provision of social amenities for everybody, social demand, which includes electricity, water, etc. Um, people coming together with their own initiatives to go on lightning, give a life, because light to me is life. Give a life to the people is, is a very, very great gesture. This is a gigantic step. I wish to commend the local team and those in the diaspora for this gesture, and I thank them so much for the initiative. The CRR governor applauded the people of Janjambure, saying 200 solar poles is not a small investment and assured them of his continuous support. Baba Dinding Jobate, the VDC chairman, says the initiative will benefit the present and future generations. This is why in the town, as VDC, we also took it a responsibility to make sure that we contribute to them personally, and all the entire Janjambreans, the VTC is out to meet them so that we can also throw our own quota to contribute. This is a guest story, it's a good guest story, especially the moment you know that lights are on and off. You know, the day, the first day this project took off, people are dancing, chatting. You can see them in the street at night. It's unfortunate that you are not here at night. You would have seen even elderly people jumping. So we are proud, we are really proud of our people. And we are praying for them, long life and prosperity with this union they form in Europe to give them progress themselves so that whatever they want, they can have it. With the country experiencing blackouts due to frequent power outage, an initiative such as this is another way of complementing government's effort to help develop our communities by dipping into our own pockets. For QTV News, Lolly M. Kamara.
the Gambe Girl Guides Association on Thursday inaugurated a new water well at the association's headquarters in Kanefeng. The well was constructed by a charitable organization sharing wonders to mitigate water shortages. Ajibintu Drame reports. Among the oldest institutions in the Gambia, the Gambia Girl Guides Association is not as vibrant like how it used to be. Currently, the institution faces many constraints. At the inauguration of a new well, the chief commissioner of the Gambia Girl Guides Association, Khadija A. Jobate, states the organization's urgent need for water. Two o'clock, normally we do our prayers before we leave. They rush to go and get some water at the GRTS because it's our opposite. Unfortunately, a car nearly knocked one of our girls down. Isa Tukoli, an executive member of the Girl Guides Association, also shows appreciation for the gesture. She explains the challenges they are facing. The problem is that most of the teachers who volunteer to be guiders to take up the programs and activities of the association are always very engaged, especially with the double shifting. So if a teacher goes to school in the morning and you want him, so we want her to go and have other activities with the children in the evening, it becomes a problem. Nowadays, most of the teachers are not always ready to volunteer because it's a voluntary work. So it's only few teachers who are always ready to take up the challenge, to train the children. Lack of funds and other resources have limited our, our ability to be able to expand. Only few people are always ready to help these girls change their lives. We don't have a lot of um, girls coming to have classes here. So it is from their school fees that we are able to do a lot here. So if we have a limited number of girls who are paying school fees and are having problems in even paying the school fees, it is very difficult for us to maintain here. We have caretakers and other staff that we have to pay their social security and other things. So having funds to renovate and look after the place the way we want is also a problem. Isa Tujame, a student at the Gambia Girl Guide School, says she feels elated that the water problem is now addressed. However, she hopes more changes will be done for the betterment and welfare of the school. I am very happy because you can see, as you can see the school, we need, we need chairs, we need, like, we just have to make the school again. Since 1988, the Gambia Girl Guides Association has been training women and girls in skills acquisition for employment and independence, teaching them handicrafts, tailoring, cookery, batik making and tie and dye, as well as restaurants and hotel management. The association was formed in 1923 by women and spouses of British civil servants. In 1966, the Gambia Girl Guides Association became a full member of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts based in UK. Ajibintu Drame, QTV News. We will go for a short commercial break and when we come back, the news continues with international and sports news stories. Do stay tuned. <music> Welcome back. In international news, today, 10th September, is Suicide Prevention Day, a day set aside by the United Nations to provide worldwide commitment and action to prevent suicides. As Jane Basanko reports, the president of the Association for Psychosocial Innovation, Guy Masisa, said governments should come up with a national suicide prevention strategy to educate Gambians about suicide. The theme for this year is working together to prevent suicide. Reflecting that ending suicide is a collective responsibility and provides an opportunity to people across the globe to raise awareness of suicide and suicide prevention. It is also a day of remembrance to mourn those who have passed away and also serve as a global call to check in with one another. 
World Suicide Prevention Day has been, it's been commemorated to raise awareness globally. So I believe in the Gambia we should also follow this trend because it's not just a Western thing, it's actually a global thing. Because every 40, every 40 seconds, somebody is dying from suicide, somebody dies from suicide. So it's very important that Gambians are aware of what suicide is, they're aware of the factors that cause suicide, so that, that way, and also they're aware of the warning signs of suicide, so that we can prevent it. Because when we pretend or believe that it doesn't exist, we turn a blind eye to the problem, we don't really help the problem, we only tend to compound the problem. Mental disorders are part of the main reasons individuals commit suicide, and the ongoing pandemic has severely affected mental health. Staying at home, low levels of physical activity, less socializing, and unexpected changes in the way everything works has made it important to highlight suicide prevention. What are certainties about work and life a year ago are no longer so. Every year, around 800,000 people around the world die by suicide. The latest UN study shows that one person dies by suicide every 40 seconds. In 2009, the UN reported that more people died by suicide than from acts of violence. Some suicides are from large extended families. Others are so lonely that they feel they have no one to turn to. A couple of different risk factors when it comes to suicide. So you have things like I mentioned before, mental health disorders. You have substance abuse. You have um, the violence in the family, so family violence. If somebody has, um, has prior suicide attempt, they're more likely to actually try it again. Um, you have things like medical illnesses, so it's, and this really applies mostly to terminal illnesses or chronic illnesses, where the person, um, it's really hard for the person and they feel like they have no reason to live anymore and they've suffered so much because of the illness. So these are different um, risk factors that can predispose somebody to, to try to take their lives. Since the WHO's first report on the issue was filed in 2014, the number of countries with national suicide prevention strategies has increased and now stands at 38. However, according to the WHO, this participation is still far too few and governments need to commit to establishing them. Ngai Masisa says that governments should decriminalize suicide and focus more on how to prevent suicide from occurring by coming up with a national suicide prevention strategy to educate Gambians about suicide. So what the government should actually do, for example, is set up a national suicide prevention strategy that really brings up, brings together different um, sectors in the, in the country, in, in, in the government, to see how best they can prevent it. And this, of course, includes economic, economic, the economic sector, um, the social sector, the health sector as well. They should try to make sure that mental health, is, mental health um, facilities are available to, to, throughout the country for people, because most of the time people don't even realize they have depression, they have mental health issues, and that is why they take their lives. Um, when there's abuse in the family, when there's family violence, you don't have anywhere to go to, you feel like um, the world is dark, there's no, there's, life is not worth living, you end up taking your life. So when the government... Suicide prevention starts with recognizing the warning signs and taking them seriously. It requires efforts by family, friends, co-workers, community members, educators, religious leaders, healthcare professionals, political officials and governments. Fear and imposed isolation due to COVID-19 have raised concerns about the impact on mental health on a global scale. The severe anticipation global recession and substantial increases in unemployment and indebtedness are both risk factors for suicide. The recipe for preventing suicide amidst the coronavirus pandemic includes investment in mental health care, such as providing suicide prevention services and active employment policies. The campaign is to light a candle near a window at 8 p.m. to show support for suicide prevention, to remember a lost loved one, and to show support for survivors of suicide. For QTV News, I am Jenna Bosonko. Top South African human rights lawyer George Bezos, who famously defended Nelson Mandela during the apartheid era in South Africa, has died at age 92. Mr. Bezos became one of the architects of South Africa's new constitution after also representing some of the country's best known political activists during the apartheid years. George Bezos was born in Greece and came to South Africa at the age of 13 as a World War II refugee. 
He met Mandela while studying law in Johannesburg and later went on to represent his friend and other anti apartheid activists fighting the apartheid rulers in South Africa in different courts. He also represented Mandela during his trial, which Mandela and other anti apartheid activists were sentenced to life imprisonment in 1964 on charges of seeking to overthrow the apartheid government. At the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he represented families of anti-apartheid activists who were killed during apartheid. Bezos is credited for adding the words, if needs be, to Mandela's famous speech at the trial, in which he said he was prepared to die. In Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, he describes him as a man who combined a sympathetic nature with an incisive mind. Leading tributes to him, South Africa's president, Sare Ramaphosa, described Mr. Bezos as an incisive legal mind and said his death was very sad for us as a country. In the same vein, the Nelson Mandela Foundation said, Another giant of South African history and of global struggles for justice has fallen. Ajibintu Drame, QTV News. We will take another short break and we continue with sports when we return. Your favorite QSouth service has gotten bigger. e Kanta. Now you can loan bigger credit amounts to make life easier for you, loan $75 and $100 and pay later. Yes, you heard me right. Get credit loan from $10 to $100 using e Kanta by dialing star 393 hash. Anytime you run out of credit, whether you want to buy Q Power, browse the internet, make urgent calls, or send SMS. Efa Kanta is the service for you. Dial star 393 hash and choose the loan amount of your choice with no hassle. For more information, call our customer care on 111. QSEL, Sunyabus, the pioneers of mobile loan service in the Gambia. We innovate, others follow. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. In sports news, two-time Olympic champion Casta Semenya has lost an appeal to Switzerland's Federal Supreme Court against the restriction of testosterone in female athletes. More in this report. Casta Semenya of South Africa lost what appeared to be her last appeal to compete at 800 meters. Her signature event at the postponed Tokyo Olympics next summer. The two-time Olympic track champion has a rare genetic condition that significantly elevated her testosterone levels. I refuse to be drugged by the wall athletics or stop from being who I am. 29-year-old South African Casta Semenya said after learning that her appeal had been rejected. Semenya is not allowed to compete in events between 400 meter and a mile without taking testosterone-reducing drugs following a 2019 rule change by the sports governing body, Wall Athletics. The Court of Arbitration for Sport rejected Semenya's challenge against the rule, which was temporarily suspended by the Swiss Supreme Court before later reversing its decision. The ruling meant Semenya, Olympic champion in the 800 meter in 2012 and 2016, missed the chance to defeat her world title in Doha 2019, having failed in her bid to prevent the governing body's rule chain. In a statement, World Athletics said, For the last five years, World Athletics has fought for and defended equal rights and opportunities for all women and girls in our sport today, and in the future, and welcomed the decision by the Swiss Federal Tribunal to uphold their decision. Semenya, meanwhile, has stated that she intends to compete at the 200 meters where the same restrictions do not apply. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jaina Basongo. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. The Education Ministry is getting ready to reopen schools and told us what precautions will be in place. A stakeholder's virtual roundtable meeting discussed COVID-19 service delivery decisions and level of accountability to citizens for various countries. We heard how the community of Janjangbure has decided to act to address the lack of street lighting in their area. The Girl Guides get a brand new well at their headquarters. In international news, 
on World Suicide Prevention Day, we heard a proposal for a Gambian national strategy on suicide prevention. And the lawyer who defended Nelson Mandela and many others against charges filed by South Africa's apartheid regime has died at the age of 92. In sports news, South African truck star Casta Semenya lost her latest court appeal over allowable testosterone levels for female athletes. That's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you for watching.